We have um, Shahira Amin. She will be talking to us about walking the fine line between journalism and activism. Let me introduce Shahira properly. Shahira is an independent Egyptian journalist based in Cairo. She resigned as the deputy head of Egyptian state-owned Nile TV during the January 2011 uprising against Mr. Mubarak to protest state TV coverage. She will tell you about that experience and she will talk, she will talk to you about journalism and activism. Let's all welcome Shahira. Magandam Hapon. <laughs> it's great to be in your beautiful city and I hope to come back here on holiday and that Takloban will have completely recovered by then. I'm delighted to be able to share my story with you, hoping that it'll inspire and motivate you, just as the work of Kelly Arena and Maria Ressa have inspired me. Um, now, for 20 something years, I was a government employee working for state television in Egypt, public television. At the same time, uh, for the last 12 years, I was a freelance correspondent uh, filing stories from the North Africa region uh, for CNN's Inside Africa. So, I haven't always been independent, but then came the breakpoint during the Egyptian revolution of 2011. I quit my job as senior anchor and deputy head of state-run Nile TV on the 3rd of February 2011, as the uprising was taking place in Tahrir to protest censorship uh, at the station where I worked. I was asked, I asked for a camera crew to go to Tahrir to cover the protests but was told to go cover instead the pro-Mubarak rallies, which were very small, insignificant, and clearly were organized by the state. Here was history being made in my own backyard, and I wasn't allowed to tell the story. This was what Nile TV was showing, serene images of the River Nile, and this was what was happening. Opposition activists were being tear-gassed um, and they were beaten, they were shot at by security forces. So this was what was happening on the ground, but this was what my channel was showing. I sent my boss a message, a text message uh, saying, forgive me, I'm not coming back. I'm on the side of the people, not the regime. And I went straight to Tahrir Square and I joined the protesters. Now that act sent a very clear message whose side I was on. Uh, and that was a decisive moment. I felt I could no longer work for a channel that was a government mouthpiece, a propaganda tool for the autocratic regime. That was the reason it was a spur of the moment decision. And this was my last uh, appearance on Nile TV. Um, the government had given me, the Interior Ministry had handed us press releases to read that labeled the opposition activists paid thugs and foreign agents. And I knew as a journalist that I should not be taking directives from anyone, not from the government, not from private individuals. And that was why I took a stand. Uh, I joined the protesters. So this was an act of activism, right? Activism, the dictionary tells you, is a practice that emphasizes direct vigorous action, especially in support of or in opposition to one side of a controversial issue. Now, I was in Tahrir, and when I was there, I walked the fine line between being a participant and an observer, because that's what a good journalist does. A good journalist observes, gathers information, and reports truth. But when I saw a protester being beaten or shot 
There was no way I could stand idly by and watch from a distance. I felt I had to intervene. After all, a human life is far more important than documenting someone's death. And I realized then that it feels very different when it hits close to home, when it becomes personal, when the outcome of the battle will influence your life or your children's future, it's no longer to, uh, possible to stay detached. And this is what we do when we're reporting a story or when we're practicing journalism. You try to remain neutral and st stay detached. But I couldn't do it in Tahrir. And that was the lesson I learned. I discovered that objectivity very hard to maintain when violence escalates. And I felt morally compelled to join the protesters rather than just document what was happening. And of course, because the issue was so close to me, there was conflict of interest. It was impossible to maintain even the slightest level of objectivity. Now, in a desperate attempt to quell the street protest, Hosni Mubarak pulled the plug. He cut off the internet and mobile phone services to stop all communications. The activists had been using social media to plan, organize, and mobilize protests. And they told the world what Egyptian media wasn't telling them. Everyone had a cell phone and they were uploading pictures and videos on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, and they played the role of the journalists. Uh, you know, the, the role that traditional media ought to have played. And they challenged the state narrative with their own anti-regime counter-narrative. Around the world, media organizations picked up the story from the citizen journalists and from international media, the unsung heroes of the revolution, I would say. But as a journalist, you're concerned about truth and accuracy. Now, that is a big concern with social media now, especially because everything travels so fast. It's not necessarily authentic. So you have to be very careful when you're incorporating social media in your work Always check the facts and always make sure that the source is reliable. Uh, in good journalism, yeah, so code of ethics tells you to be truthful, accurate, objective, fair, impartial, and to hold both the government and uh, the private sector to account. This is good journalism where all voices must be heard. Uh, unfortunately, in today's Egypt, that is not the case because the government has placed a ban on journalists speaking to the opposition. And that is why three Al Jazeera English journalists are now behind bars because they were telling both sides of the story. They're being charged with aiding a terror group uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been designated a terror group by Egypt, uh, just because they aired all viewpoints and they got seven years in jail. They are in jail as I speak now. It's wrong to think that a story has only two sides because I would say that a story may have 15 or more sides. And here is what I do before I go and cover any story. I always ask myself, who needs to know the story? Who am I telling the story to? And how much information do they need to know? Will the story harm or will it help? What are the consequences of telling a story? And what are the choices? What choices do I as a journalist have? That way you make an ethical decision. Since the revolution, I've gone back to Tahrir many times. I've reported on the protests that have taken place over the last three years. And I have watched the young protesters being beaten by riot police, 
And a part of me has always wanted to intervene, you know, to hold the policeman by the hand and say, stop. But I felt that by doing so, by interfering, this would distort the reality. Uh, and I told myself that if I became an agent rather than an observer, then what is the point of me being there? Fundamentally, the role of the journalist in these situations is to observe, to recount reality as faithfully as you can, and not to try to shape the reality by interfering. Sometimes that's hard. But in addition to truth, where does your loyalty lie? And your loyalty must always be to your audience. If you're a print journalist, it is to your reader. If you're a broadcaster, it is to the viewer. And I've done lots of stories on sexual violence, sexual harassment, child marriages, uh, domestic violence. But I never, you know, my loyalty wasn't with the victim. It was to the public because I always felt that I'm telling the public the story because I want to change public attitudes. Uh, they are the ones that need to know it's not okay to beat your wife. It's not a socially acceptable norm to harass women on the streets. And sometimes this is difficult in a patriarchal conservative society like Egypt. And you have to think very carefully how you can present the story so that it, it is palatable to your audience, so that, it, that they can stomach it. Otherwise, they're going to totally dismiss it. And one way of doing that is not by being too explicit or too graphic. Uh, try to avoid sensationalism, because that always has an opposite effect. Recently, somebody uploaded a video on YouTube of this woman being sexually harassed by a mob in Tahrir Square. She was stripped naked. The video showed the woman's face. And this is extremely shameful in Egyptian society. It stripped her of her dignity. And the video led to the arrests of the culprits, uh, those who committed the crime. But was that ethical? You must always consider uh, your subject's dignity uh, and, and try, you know, uh, and to respect their privacy. And this is the new president took roses and went to visit her at the hospital. And she begged him on that day. She pleaded with him, please have the video removed off YouTube. So these are the questions you need to ask. What does the audience want to hear? How does it want this information presented? How will the community receive the information? And how much detail does the piece need? How graphic should it be? Always, of course, the issues of privacy and dignity uh, come up foremost. Every journalist approaches the news with some natural bias. Is there anything? Uh, such as 100% objectivity? I would say definitely not, because we all have our biases, uh, whether biases of gender, religion, your political, your sexual affiliation, all of that. So it's almost impossible to be objective. But we are asked to be fair, balanced, skeptical, and thorough. As reporters, if your country is at war and you were reporting from the front lines, sometimes it's hard to be totally neutral and fair. And this has happened many times when you're passionate about a cause. I've seen journalists doctor photographs or create bogus videos. Now that is totally unethical, of course. So never fall in the trap of fabricated evidence, because that would cost you your credibility. Recently in Egypt, um, Al Jazeera showed images of pro-military protesters with a caption that claimed they were anti-military demonstrators. The network later apologized, saying it was a mistake. 
But it was already too late. Al Jazeera had lost its credibility in Egypt. Now, where do we draw the line? Some of my journalist friends tell me that they will not cover stories that, are, that have too much of a personal interest for them. But as a journalist, I feel it's very important to stay involved in your community because the media, of course, is a very powerful tool in effecting change. By putting the spotlight on an issue, you bring it to public attention. You decide what the public needs to know. And I often you know, follow the tweets because I, I truly believe that if it's not being tweeted, then it's not newsworthy. Uh, that's where I find ideas for my stories, really. But like activists, journalists too often want to right the wrongs in your society. But it's also important to think how we gather and curate the data. How do we incorporate social media how to avoid the ethical traps, and how to package your stories in a credible fashion. Recently, a talk show presenter on one of the Egyptian satellite channels, uh, he has been broadcasting a series of episodes of recorded telephone conversations with the revolutionary activists uh, trying to tarnish their reputation and prove that they are foreign agents. Now, is that professional journalism? It's an invasion of privacy. So, how far do you go to prove your point? Should we, as reporters, for instance, offer bribes to prompt someone to commit an illegal act and then catch the culprit red-handed and report about it. If you're covering a corruption story, you want to present the hard evidence, you know, and, and, and back your claims of corruption. But we need to balance the public's right to know against the possibility of breaking laws, invading people's privacy, and maybe implicating uh, innocent people through guilt by association. So as we pursue our reporting, we must familiarize ourselves with the laws of the country in which we are working. Also, the, the regulations of your, of your news organization, because you need that support. You need your organization to support you. And also, you have to know how to take preventive measures to protect yourself, but always keep media ethics in mind. Now, I'll just give you an example of how my work has made a difference on the ground. Back in 2003, I did a story on female genital mutilation, which is the cutting of girls. This is a socio-cultural practice that dates back centuries in my country. And a UN study has found that more than 90% of Egyptian women have been subjected to this practice. It was a taboo issue at the time, and the media wasn't talking about it. So I know the harm, both psychologically and physically, that it does to the girls. And several girls lost their lives in the last few years uh, because they bled during the operation. Uh, so I did the first story, and I got a call from state security saying, why are you trying to tarnish the image of the country? Next time, you will disappear off the face of the earth. Now, I had to make the choice, either be silenced, intimidated, or to continue. Only by being consistent and persistent you know, by reminding the public from time to time of that same issue, which I felt was critical. I went back and revisited the story. And in 2008, this government minister awarded me. I got an award from government saying, thank you for helping us put a law into place criminalizing female genital mutilation. 
So, but it wasn't me alone. I mean, the story got picked up by other journalists because, you know, courage is contagious. You take somebody else's lead and you follow. And there was another story about virginity tests, virginity checks that the military performed on female protesters right after the January 2011 revolution. They took 17 girls in the museum grounds and performed, the military performed these virginity tests on the women in front of soldiers. And one very brave girl spoke out. And for two months, the military denied that this had happened. So when I heard the story of Samira Ibrahim, who came forward and said that her right had been violated, and she filed a lawsuit against the military, which was very brave, it was the first crack in their impunity, really, um, I decided to cover the story, but I also went to the military general, a senior military general, and asked him. And he said, he admitted that the tests had been performed. He was almost sure that I wouldn't have the courage to broadcast what he had told me because, you know, in, that's the way it is in Egyptian culture. The military is off limits. So I went live at three in the morning with my interview on CNN and at seven o'clock the next morning, the activists were back on the streets chanting down with military rule. And that summer, we had a law, another law that came into effect saying that these tests will never be performed again in Egypt. That's the power of good journalism. You know, you don't fabricate, but you seek truth and you report it. And you do make a difference. Finally, uh, the kind of journalism I do is what is normally known as advocacy journalism because it's where journalism and activism meets. It is fact-based but supports a specific point of view on an issue. Uh, if you think of the stories that matter, the critical stories, and you keep them in the news, then you can effect positive change. And the journalism that we practice can be a powerful form of activism. Now, since quitting my job with mainstream media, I have found that online journalism suits me better because my work isn't censored. I now write for a free expression portal in the UK called Index on Censorship. And I have more freedom now than I have ever had before. I also produce documentaries for the UN. And I use my journalism to bring attention to women's rights, sexual violence, and other issues that matter to me. Have I paid a high price for my activism? I would tell you yes, because I gave up a dream job, uh, a stable salary, a, a well-paid job, prestigious, prestigious job. But at the same time, uh, I've also been attacked by mobs on the streets, because right now Egypt is very McCarthyist. Um, but my work has been very fulfilling and rewarding. I've gained international recognition won many awards, and I am well respected, you know, both inside and outside Egypt. And, but the most important thing is I sleep at night with a clear conscience. I feel I don't have blood on my hands. So when someone asks me, are you a journalist or an activist? I reply, an activist journalist. Because for me, one begins where the other leaves off. Thank you.